This is our third session now on Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Put on then like a garment or like insignias on a garment or various articles of clothing, and then he lists some of them. Put on then as your identifying uniform as a Christian, which is very much deeper than that in the sense that you're to put on your true self. Put on then as God's chosen, holy, and loved, bowels of mercy, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. If anyone has a complaint against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And over all these, put on love, which is a bond of completeness or maturity or perfection. Father, as we try to understand what it means to bear with one another and forgive each other, work the miracle in us of a life disposition that can actually respond in great wisdom to the perplexities of life where we're just not sure in ourselves what the most loving thing to do is. I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I wasn't completely happy with something I showed you last time. I still agree with it, but I'll tell you why I wasn't completely happy. Remember, I said that uh, inner intestines of mercy yields kindness. That's a pair. This is a form of treating people, and this is the inner reality. Lowliness is the inner reality, and it yields the outer demeanor of meekness, and that's a pair. And then I suggested that this is a pair, the inner disposition to be a long-suffering, that is, you're willing to endure a lot of hurt or pain or sadness, and that yields a bearing with one another. I think that's true. I think that's reality. But what's not completely satisfying about it, I'm going to erase this, is that grammatically, Paul really did start something new here. No, no, not there. Here, with these participles. So these are all nouns, bowels of mercy, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering. But this, bearing with one another, that's a participle. And it's paired grammatically with forgiving each other. So we don't have to reject the reality behind the disposition of long suffering yielding a willingness to bear with people in order to say, now what's this pair about? Why does he start a new way of saying it with a different kind of a verbal form, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. And the condition there is if there's a problem, if one has a complaint against one another. So let me try to draw this. Here's me and here's you, all right? And I want to figure out what's going on here with forbearing and forgiving and the complaint here. So the first step is that you you sin against me, or it just might be offend me, or annoy me, or hurt me, okay, any one of those. And uh, I have, therefore, what? A complaint. Complaint against you. I might express it, I might not, but that's where that is. If anyone has a complaint, assumes somebody has done something to complain about. So that's the situation. You've done this to me, and now I am feeling maybe very angry or may just mildly annoyed, but I've got this little complaint. Now, here's some possibilities that can result. I can point that out, and you can repent. 
or just admit you're sorry and say, you didn't mean to. You, you said something that was hurtful and you had no intention of doing whatsoever. And it did. And, and you, you're, you take it back and you're sorry. Or it might be you really did mean to hurt me and you need to really repent of something sinful. So that may happen. And if that repentance happens, then it says, I'm supposed to forgive. And this raises many questions, doesn't it? People ask, well, what if the repentance doesn't happen and they really are guilty of something and they, they either are too stubborn or proud to repent or they don't think they did wrong? And I think they did wrong. Is forgiveness even possible there? And I think um, the answer to that is not easy because in one sense it is because inside this reality of forgiveness is a, a, a goodwill toward another person. You don't want to hurt them. You want to bless them. And you can still have that goodwill. That's what Jesus says here in Luke 6. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good, do good to those who hate you. This is a person who's not saying, I'm sorry. And you still do good, right? Bless those who curse you. This is a person who's not repenting. They are not repenting. They are mad at you. It's all get out. And you are going to bless them and do good to them. And you're going to pray for those who abuse you. So this is, this is why I say that there is a aspect of the reality of forgiveness, which is a goodwill that can happen when this repentance doesn't happen. But in order for forgiveness to, to close the deal, sort of, to, to be reconciled, there has to be repentance. And so part of forgiveness can happen where there's no repentance. For repentance to happen, I mean, for forgiveness to be full, there needs to be repentance. Like, like Jesus said here in Luke 17, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, draw it to his attention. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, that's the whole deal. Wrong, repentance, forgiveness. Or here's Jesus saying it in Matthew 18. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times. 77 times. In other words, stop counting. Have a disposition to be forgiving. What if the repentance doesn't happen and it's not a disciplinable offense by the whole church? It's not at that level. Then comes in this to make it sound like a parallel, we could use the word, I'm going to draw another line here, and this, this happens if this doesn't happen. If, if repentance doesn't happen, or maybe if it does repeatedly happen, I need to for, can't remember whether it has an E in it or not, forbear. Forbear means bear with. Isn't it interesting? that he's calling us to be forgiving of one another. And if forgiveness really happens in both directions, you, you um, repenting and, and really sorry and me really forgiving, you don't need any, any forbearance, right? It's just clear. It's wonderful. Forbearance is bearing with. The literal word here is endure. Enduring one another implies something's not complete in the relationship. And we all live with this. I mean, if you're married, you know this. There are things about your spouse that you wish would be different. You might sometimes think they rise to the level of sin. They gall you so much. They're probably not. <laughs> or they might be. And you need to be forbearing. Now, let me pose this question. 
that really does raise a lot of perplexities, doesn't it? Perplexities about when a person doesn't repent and you think they've wronged you. Perplexities about the seriousness of the complaint like or the hurt. How serious was it? I mean, some hurts, like murder <laughs> or something even short of it, must be dealt with sometimes by the police, sometimes by the elders of the church, sometimes with church discipline. But most of the things that bother us or offend us aren't at that level. But how do we handle the, the ambiguities and the perplexities of what is at that level and what isn't at that level? And how do we handle the question of whether forbearance is a cop-out? And that you're not really helping the person grow in grace by just uh, tolerating things that need to be worked on. So, what help does Paul give us in handling the perplexity? And I think he gives us two helps. This is the first one, and this is the second one. We'll deal with one real quickly and then turn for next time to this. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also forgive. In other words, he turns our attention away from all the perplexities here and says, I want you to focus for a minute on what has happened to you. I just made a list to myself. How how has the Lord forgiven me? He has forgiven things, things I don't remember to Confess. I'm sure I don't remember all my sins to confess them to the Lord. And he doesn't itemize them that way. He wants me to confess what I know to be sin, but all my sins are forgiven by Jesus, even the ones I don't remember to confess. He forgives me repeatedly. Oh my goodness. I'm 75 years old. How many thousands of sins has Jesus forgiven for John Piper? He forgives as one who is totally innocent. He's never done anything. You know, anybody who sins, um, that, that we sin against and they call us to account, we can say, well, you did it too. <laughs> you can never say that to Jesus. Never. He's totally innocent. If anybody is uh, deserving not to forgive, it would be Jesus. But he always is willing to forgive. He forgives without payment. He forgives and really, really lets it go. As far as the East is from the West, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And that list I'm sure it could go on and on. Here's the point. I think what Paul is saying here, as you have been forgiven, so you forgive. Turn your your eye away from all these perplexities and ambiguities of relational conflict. Set your face toward the cross and what happened there and be amazed. Be amazed. Live amazed that you are forgiven. I don't think there's any way for a marriage to survive or a church to survive all the relational perplexities and ambiguities and offenses if it's not a people who are amazed mainly, not at what people do against them, but what they've done against God and that their list has been canceled. They are forgiven. I think that will go a long way to solving all the ambiguities and perplexities we have here. And then he says, over all these, put on love, which is a bond of completeness. I think that too is intended to help us manage all these perplexing things, because these here is this list, and on top of them goes love. We've got to figure that out next time.